I went a little long because I wanted to get that out, and you guys normally don't have a lot of questions anyway. <laughs> but I appreciate Rabbi Steve allowing me to get that out. It was hard, at least for me, but it, it was worth it for you guys because I want to see you guys successful. One thing I want to clarify that brought to my memory as we go into the afterburn, this is the afterburn where you can ask questions, comments. But one thing that uh, came to my mind when Rabbi Steve walked up was the fact of me telling you guys where we came from, from the journey, on the journey and really clarifying something. And that is, even though many of you and all of you just about that came out of the church had you know, made a sigh or made a comment or agreed that in church they teach you that divorce is, is bad. And we got here and was liberated and freed when Rabbi told us that divorce is not even in the Bible. And I've taught and I've counseled that, you know, unless there's something absolutely necessary, which I still hold true, you should try to work it out if you want to. You guys know it, and if you don't, you know we don't condone any kind of abuse as leadership. But we also don't make excuses for you to stay in the relationship when it's not beneficial to your health or to your well-being. That includes your mental state. And so I've heard rumors that, y'all, that some people think that we're all about having you get a divorce. No, we're not. We're all about setting you free. Maybe you're not in a mental, emotional place to be set free, to understand that we want you to be free. You should want to be free. You should want, not want to live in a box. You should not want to live under a rock. You should not want to live in fear. You should not want to live in panic. You should want to live free. Loving and being loved. Amen? Amen. So if you got any questions or comments, you can come up. You can start typing them in online. I got my dollar rabbi right here. <laughs> oh, no. John is coming. This will be easier if I just hold it, I think. I do have some things I want to say first. Let me get up here. All right, so first of all, excellent job. Elder did a great job today. Thank you. Fantastic job. All right? I know Marty's going to be throwing a fit watching me mess with this stupid mic stand, and it's in the video and all that stuff. Well, that's, <laughs> we're just live and real. What can we do? All right, so I took a couple of important notes I want to just kind of clarify some things that actually came up after I gave you the extended time. See what happens when you handle the prayer time a little faster? So you get extra yes. time. Okay, Thank sorry. You. <laughs> Thank you. So the most important note I wrote here was pay elder 99%. <laughs> so I, I, wrote, I wrote that down. You did. Yeah, pay, pay elder 99%. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. No. So those questions that he gave you, those four questions... Here's the problem that you're gonna have with that, or at least potentially, okay? You have to ask the question with absolutely nothing preset about the answer. You can't expect anything in particular or have any issue. You're asking a question, you will accept the answer as the truth. So when you say, are you getting what you need from me? And the person says, well, no, I could do that. But don't you think you know what they need? Or when he says, is there anything I can do for you? Well, it shouldn't just be the things he has in his mind that he thinks you need or that you think he needs if you're the one asking the question. You ask the question completely open to the answer. Okay, I don't know that that was as clear as maybe he would like that to have been in when he was saying it. So when you say things like, can I get you anything? Can I do anything for you? Don't have any limiters in your brain, okay? Well, I mean, I said I could do, you know, is there anything but not that? No. You ask a question, it should include whatever that might include. I mean. Okay? And that's, I think, what he really meant when he was going through that, okay? So you have to be careful that you have not blocked in and boxed in the answer to the question. You're giving them a question that it's very open-ended. But you don't, you don't get to put limiters on it. This is your spouse, okay? Yeah, you might need some limiters when you ask other people questions. But you want the full, open answer. 
Amen. Okay, so I'm just saying that. So when, if you go to your spouse and say, hey, do you need anything? Can I do anything for you? And they say, yeah, I could really use, you know, to get the garbage, or can you go do this, can you do a lawn? Then, I mean, you have to be, if you're willing to say, is there anything you need, which means I'm here to help you, it shouldn't matter what they say. Amen. Ladies, that goes the same way the other way. Mm -hmm. I know he was focusing more on the guys today, but I'm just saying it goes in both directions. See, the problem is we spend most of our time focused, as he said, on what I need. I don't think about what you might need. And by the way, the right way I just said it is if I'm going to think about what you need, I shouldn't think about it. I should ask you. What I'm thinking is you might need something. That's the right thought. I wonder if she needs something. Not like I've observed things and thought, oh, she doesn't need anything. Okay, or you look at him and you go, he doesn't need anything. Why don't you ask? And not box in the answer. Okay, that's really the thing. But normally you're walking around going, how come he doesn't notice that I need help with this? And I, well, how about just asking? Okay, if he doesn't ask first. That's the initiating he was talking about. I mean, okay? Yeah. You know, ask if he needs anything, but also say, by the way, you know, are you okay now? Did you transition your mind, your mind from work to the, I could really use some help with something. Okay, don't wait on him. He should be asking, but if he doesn't, you certainly are welcome to ask. And say, hey, let you know I could really use some help with some things. But also ask, are you ready for that next move? Are you, are you open now to shift into that hat that you're wearing to, you know what I'm saying? Amen. Don't just dump things on, on him, all right? So anyway, no, I thought the questions were really good. I think that I was glad I left you with more time to continue that out. Now, now that I am up here, though, I gave him permission because he needs me to do that. I want you to ask him mostly your questions. I'll jump in if needed, but really I want you to ask him. He made the teaching. Ask him the questions, and he's going to answer them. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. John Connie Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. First of all, I want to thank you both, other Bill and Rabbi, for the teachings you have been given us that Amen. actually helps me understand how to become the proper man that a woman might want to have. Amen. And secondly, for us who are single, when do we start making that list to be vetting a woman? You should be making a list, your expectation list. My wife had one, I think, 13, 14 years old. I know Rebbitson, his wife had one. You can make it now. You don't have to wait for the woman. Your expectation is outside of who it is. Is what are your expectations of this woman when you find her? Okay, thank you. All right, hold on. The, the additional piece, though, is read the list that you have for her and then say, what kind of man would that person be looking mm. for? Mm. See, it's all well and good for you to have your list. But that person has a list too. And would you match up with that person's list? Okay? Because you may be looking for maybe a beautiful woman who you know, takes care of herself and everything else. And meanwhile, you don't take care of yourself. I'm not saying you don't, John. But I'm saying, but you know, you know, you have all these expectations, but is she gonna look at you and go, hey, that's the guy I've been looking for. That, you know, because you got your list, she's got her list. So just I want you to always think of it in both directions. What are you expecting? Because you are going to have expectations. Certainly you should, you know, have those things now. And you can keep changing them as you figure out that maybe some of the things on your list aren't exactly where they should be. But always ask the question, when I read that list, that person that's kind of described in that expectation list, what's the guy going to look like that they're looking for? How's he going to be acting? What's he going to be dealing with in his life? What's his life like? What is... What does he look like? I don't mean like necessarily physically, but what does that guy look like? You know, what kind of life is he providing? What is he offering that woman? Ladies, same thing. Okay, that guy that you want, what do you bring into the table? Okay, well, I want him to be this, 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 and this, and this. You know, I watched some TikTok, it was hysterical. A lady was saying, the guy said, well, what, what's the guy look like that you're looking for? Well, I'm looking for a guy who's over, at least over six foot three and makes this kind of money and does all these other things and is in great shape. He said, do you understand that that's like 1% of the population? <laughs> and she was like, did it never occur to her. <laughs> the guy you're wanting doesn't exist. With all of that, not a, not a lot of them anyway. But I mean, you have to be asking yourself the question, I want a guy, well then what do you have that will attract that man? And if you're the man and you want that woman, what do you have that would attract that woman? 
Okay, don't just make your list because you may be very frustrated that you're not becoming the man that would get that woman, that she would want. And that's really key. Did that help, John? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And that's why I leave my door open when I counsel. <laughs> For those insights, I mean. Shabbat Shalom, Ashley. Shabbat Shalom. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions, if I may. Um, one, it's funny you mentioned walls, because I was thinking about my walls right before, like, and you looked right at me, it's like, you must have read my mind or something. <laughs> um, I want to bring that up and ask a question. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I saw this TikTok reel or whatever it's called, those little short videos, and the lady said, if you don't fight your battle now with drugs or alcohol or relationships, stuff like that, um, your kids are going to have to fight it. And that hit home. And now it's like to get to the kingdom, it's even more of a battle for me because it's like, if I don't fight this, they have to fight it too. Um, and with regarding the walls about that, how do, because I know I try to bring them down and then when I see something remotely that could take my breath away and scare me, those walls slam up or slam down, whatever the right word is. How do I get that not to happen so I can ha not clam up and have that communication? As I mentioned earlier, you should be working on your marriage, in that case your trauma, your walls every day. This is something I do every day. You have to manage this every single day of your life. Rabbi talks about the drunk can't take one more drink or the cigarette person that smokes cigarette that's quit can't pick up that cigarette one more time. You have to consciously be aware. I had notes wrote down. You have to be intentional. You have to do it on purpose, that you're making these steps, that you're not allowing these walls to build up. Part of not allowing the walls to build up is to communicate, to over communicate. Me and my wife talk about everything. Absolutely everything that I can talk to her about, we talk about. There's some things emotionally I know I don't want to put that weight on her because she covers me, so I don't share everything with her, but the things I need to share about her, about me and about my walls, I share with her. If I think one of y'all looking at me cock at it, one of you young ladies, trust me, she knows. I tease, but it's the truth. I've had people, some of them are not here. <laughs> I've had people look at me, hug me, touch me, the way that I don't notice, but other people do, and I gotta be aware of that. And if she brings it up, I deal with it immediately. I don't let it linger. She says somebody hugged you the wrong way, trust me, that person is not hugging me that way again. I'm gonna be careful. Because I don't see a lot, I hug everybody, so I don't see a lot of things. But this is something you have to manage in your life every single day. If you're working on communicating with your spouse, something you have to work on every single day. Because you may get into a situation that's gonna happen where you can get a little smart. I have to work on it every day when I'm working with Rabbi. He'll tell you how many times I had to go and apologize because I thought what I said sounded a certain way. And most of the time I apologize, he said, no, I didn't hear it. But the one time, one of the times I did it, he was like, yeah, I did catch it, but I understand what you were dealing with at the time, so I didn't pay attention, but he accepted the apology. So I'm always monitoring it. Remember, he says it's not on the board, the board's gone. Observe, what's the other one? Okay, observe, learn, and adjust. Yeah. Observe, learn, and adjust. So you have to do that in your own life, looking at your own situation, as well as your spouse. I gotta do that all the time. I'm watching him, I'm learning, I'm adjusting to him as my boss, but also as the rabbi, I gotta do the same thing to my spouse because I'm serving. Everything I do is unto him, and it's unto him I'm a servant of the Most High, so in that mindset, I'm serving. So it doesn't matter if I'm serving you or serving him or serving my wife, I'm always in a serving role. And so you always have to be conscious and aware that you're making a conscious decision that you're not gonna allow this wall to form. The best way to get it out, I tell people all the time, it can't be hidden if you get it out. If you open up your mouth, say it. Speak to your husband, not your friend. You know, tell him all your business. Speak to your husband, babe, I'm dealing with this right now. And that goes into my second question. Oh, no. I don't know if it has anything to do with my hearing loss or if it's just me, but I tend to communicate a lot with body language. Um, as I so got called out last night for. But, um, and thank you for that, Rabbi. But, um, how do I, and he says, well, I can't read your mind. I'm thinking, but you can read my body, right? Like, how do I get passive just, because I'm telling you, it is so hard. He, like, every day I'm like, just look at me. You'll know how I am. If I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry, what have you. What is the steps one should take to be able to move past just 
talking and body language. Listen, listen, and I want to answer this only because the first question is really connected to this in terms of I think where people are, where maybe there's a missing piece. You asked about if you don't get this figured out, you asked two things. If you don't get this figured out, your children may deal with it, and I'll explain that actually scripturally correctly. And then you also talked about communicating these challenging areas of your life. And then, of course, now you're asking about communicating it with body language versus with words. Now, bear in mind, number one, let's deal with the children. Yes, there's a thing called generational cursing. Not what you were taught in Christianity, okay? Generational cursing, it's not that. And by the way, you did make one slip up. You said that the Bible didn't say anything about divorce. It does, but that's not what Matthew, she was talking about specifically. But divorce has a very specific thing that you need to do. But anyway, back to you. So generational cursing. Your children will deal with some things that you never dealt with. They'll also deal with things that you should have dealt with that you never dealt with. In other words, some of the things they're going to deal with are things that just were never an issue for you. Because just because your children and your children don't mean that they're all going to go, my, you know, I might have my children go through something. I'm like, my gosh, I never dealt with that. My wife goes to me, did you ever deal with that? I said, no, did you? No. Well, why are our children? Because they're different. They're individuals. On the other side of it, though, if I was an alcoholic or if I had some other, you know, addictive negative pattern that they witnessed every day, they may imitate it. That's the generational curse. Behavioral imitation generationally. So that's the risk you have with your children is that they will see and imitate something that you're doing. Now, the second part had to do with your communication, all right? Your problem, this is for all of you, pay attention is you're afraid or you fail in your communication. You're afraid or you fail because you don't just share information about your struggle. You are either lashing out outwardly or lashing out inwardly, okay, or both. So when you say whatever you say about this wall or struggle or thing that you're dealing with, you don't just say, I'm struggling, I'm in pain, and this is my problem. You are lashing out at someone you're blaming for it, whether it's you or someone outside. That's where your communication really becomes a challenge on the walls thing, the second part of that first question, okay? So when you target it inwardly or outwardly, that communication's not very good. Instead of just saying, I'm really struggling with something, instead of pointing a finger at blame. Now, you may want to figure out what's causing, that's not blaming, but look at things that may be triggering or affecting, okay, but not blaming, all right? If you have... If you have a gluten allergy, you don't blame the gluten. You just have an allergy to gluten you have to be aware of now and deal with it. Lashing out at the gluten isn't gonna fix anything. Getting angry with it isn't gonna fix anything. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? So, but you have to be aware that certain things trigger a reaction in your body. And then you may figure out, oh, gluten is one of them. Dairy is, whatever it is, right? Same thing emotionally. Certain things trigger certain things. But don't blame your husband. Blame your past. Blame your children. Blame your parents. Blame whoever. No, don't blame. Don't blame yourself either. Say, observe what's going on in your life. Learn what's actually causing the things that are happening, both good and bad, because you can learn what makes things go well, then you can repeat them. Just like the things that go badly, you can stop doing and then make the adjustments, right? And then as far as body language, look, yes, yeah, some people are an open book. You can read them by looking at them. But don't assume that people are actually paying attention. That's kind of where you were going, though. Like, you may look at your husband like, why do I have to tell you this? Can't you see I'm flipping out? Well, but not everybody's paying attention. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter how obvious it is. I know you said it's so obvious. Okay, but people do not pay attention. Others pay really close attention. They'll catch a slight different movement of your eyebrow and they'll figure out that something's going on. You could be losing your mind in front of them and they may miss it completely. Different people are paying attention to different things. Just depends on, remember, we're all taking information in and it's filtering through our perception at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so if my perception is you're fine and you're clearly not, I'm not gonna receive that. Because in my perception, I'm filtering it all through the idea, well, she's fine, all right? And so that's where we get into trouble. Um, and one last question. I want to ask it now because I'm going to forget it later. Forgive me. Do you think, um, because I'm still dealing with the dang past, I'm trying to get rid of it, but it's, it's an ugly head. Um, and do you think that if I go to the gym that I'll mentally, physically, I'll get wonders out of it, but mentally, will that help too? Because last time I tried to do that, I just got mad and like, 
It seemed like nothing helped. All right, well, nothing that you do is going to necessarily fix anything immediately. You have to do it consistently over some time. However, I can tell you as a personal trainer in my past, as, as a gym manager in my past, that there's a chemical reactions in the body to physical activity. Positive mental chemicals are produced when you exercise, okay? So yes, going to the gym should be a good stress reliever and create a production of the good chemistry in your head that makes you feel more calm and at peace, etc. It's not gonna happen in the first workout you do and the first thing you do, but if you go over time, your body's gotta to adjust to this new thing that you weren't doing, you're now doing. So the first time, it's probably just going, what in the world are we doing? But after you do it consistently, it goes, oh, I get it. This stuff gets to produce, and we get to do these things, and okay? All right, good. Miss Shira, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Elder Billy, thank you so much. Oh, this welcome. was so rich, and I found quite a bit of it to be applicable, not in an intense level, but for those of us who are single and treasure our friendships mm -hmm. and really treasure. And I, I love, Rabbi, what you said the, this morning on Zoom <laughs> about hugs. <laughs> you know, that is, that is really precious to me. And this wonderful mishpoka just gets better all the time. <laughs> and um, so I took a lot of that to heart. Amen. I would like to comment about the walls. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Whether you're married or not, I, I just love what Yahweh said to you. I'm going to take them all down. And if we are serious about going forward with him and with the mishpacha, we've got to let him do that, take all the walls down. Amen. Amen. There is one wall that, in my opinion, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there is one wall that if we have, the marriage is absolutely doomed if we don't deal with it. And that is a root of bitterness. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what destroyed my first marriage after 25 years of trying so hard. Oh, I was no angel, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> but I would always come crawling and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, you know, I, after 25 years of cold shoulder, but he wanted, he wanted the marriage because he loved the security of my loving family. Mm. And so there was just, but there was nothing to work with. Mm -hmm. Counseling didn't help. <laughs> and so um, I, just, I just would encourage anyone that wants to keep their marriage and wants it to grow, really look at any little place of unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. Don't let that root. I know with my first husband, it was generational. His, his dad's family had just about destroyed each other because of it. His mom had it, and they got divorced because of it. And so that was all he knew. I don't blame him. May he rest in peace. He's gone now. But um, I, just, I just long for that particular wall to be sure that you deal with it. I mean, I mean, one of the life-changing, since I've been here, because I mentioned this all happened years ago, when Rabbi did that uh, restoration, the forgiveness restoration, reconciliation, it broke me again. It broke me and healed me at the same time. <laughs> I was sitting back there or over there when he, when he taught it, and it really spoke volumes to me because those walls, some of the walls begin to creep up, and you can beat them down every day. They're still going to creep up. You have to manage it every single day, intentionally, consciously. And when he hit that one for unforgiveness, because I tell people, I counsel people, and I tell them, you got to learn to forgive again. They said, what do you mean? Didn't I get forgiveness the first time? I said, have you ever heard Rabbi teach it? Yes, you forgave. But if that memory comes up and it still has an emotional attachment to you, I teach them to forgive again. Not that they're actually forgiving, forgiving it again, but to speak it out of their mouth until they're able to let go of it. So forgive and forgive again. The same thing with I do. You're going to have to say a lot of I do's in the face of forgiving again. But if you choose to take that step forward, that's why we work so hard in counseling, trying to get the, the couples to a place where they can tell us what they want. We've had many couples not been able to tell us what they want and we don't, they don't come anymore. But until you figure out what you want, if you wanna move forward, we can help you guide through that process. But that is so much 
That is so true. And that teaching, if you haven't heard it, forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration, it teaches you the difference between you can forgive, you don't have to reconcile or restore, but you can forgive because forgiveness is for you. So I mean. All right, and, and you must, you must forgive. But actually, for sure, the thing is, you were talking about the root of bitterness, all right? And this is part of what Elder was talking about at the end of the teaching where he says, part of what we want is for you to be free. And free really is not necessarily just a physical thing, it's an emotional problem. You're emotionally in bondage. And so where is this root of bitterness coming from? Well, it's coming from this thing called unforgiveness. And what's unforgiveness? Because I know in Christianity it was weaponized in a wrong way, all right? Well, you and I are not close anymore, so you must not have forgiven me. No, forgiveness is very simple. It is the releasing of all negative emotion attachments to whatever happened, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you're in a bad marriage, or a marriage that's challenged bad enough, and you don't release the negative feelings, they fester, they become this root of bitterness. And so then there is no freedom. So that's where you have to make a choice. That's where we ask you what you want. Problem is, it's hard to say what you want when you don't realize you're allowed to make either choice. Mm. And so once you realize, I can leave, or I can work towards fixing, then there's some freedom that starts to come into it. And then if you're going to come into the, well, actually either choice, if you're gonna go into the fixing it mode, then you have to be able to communicate. Maybe the, the reason you've got the bitterness is because you have this thing you don't communicate that the person just does not know that you're suffering so much. Either because you've been afraid to tell them or because the one time you tried it was blown up in your face or something. So there is no fixing or rest, you gotta go to the second part and third part of that if you want, the restoration reconciliation. That's if you want the marriage to stay and, and, and move forward. Then there has to be a forgiveness, a releasing of the negative. I've got couple after couple that, you know, well I don't trust her or I don't trust him. Well then you're never gonna make it. Oh, but what they did, well then get a divorce or decide to trust them now. But what if they do it again? What if they don't? I mean, it can go either way, but you can't go forward unless you let go of what already happened. Amen. Elder was very open about some things that happened, some big mistakes that he had made. But for that to go forward, there had to be a letting go or there is no moving forward, Amen. okay? And so that's where this root of bitterness can come in. People are bitter because they can't let go of some pain some emotional negative place, all right? And you gotta release that because it will kill you ultimately, mm -hmm. all right? Good. Yeah. All right, live stream. Get from Angela Stone, what is the expectation list? Is that for someone who is looking for a partner? You wanna explain that you created? <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, it's, it's not like a specific thing. In every relationship, it's very simple. This stuff, by the way, and thank you, Angela, for the question, but you're already doing this, okay? Every relationship, each person in the relationship has expectations about the relationship. They don't necessarily think of them consciously at any given moment, okay? And so if your relationship is challenged, I don't care if it's with your wife, your husband, your child, an employee, an employer, a friend, it's because somewhere expectations are not being met by one or both of the people involved. Now, the anger even builds higher though than just being frustrated with the expectations not being met when you make the assumption that the other person has the same expectations that you do and now you don't understand why they're not meeting them. But the re reality is that they don't necessarily have the same expectations, all right? Not like zero the same, but there are aspects that that's why you struggle are the aspects that you don't have the same, all right? So this expectations list is simply in whatever relationship. We've been talking about husband and wife, so let's use that. And that's where I first came up with the idea, right? It's dealing with marriage stuff. Because I realized when I started counseling all of these marriages that were challenged, I realized that the problem was, I have a man who came into this marriage with a clear idea, not necessarily consciously aware of, but a clear idea of what he was supposed to do as the husband and what he expected her to do as the wife. And then on the other side, I have this woman 
who had in her mind, maybe not so consciously, an awareness of what she was offering him, what he can expect from her as a wife and what she expected from him as a husband. Problem is, they never had the conversation. They just assumed that everybody sees it the same, and they don't. Okay, I don't even care if you have the same cultural background and everything else. There's still going to be aspects that you do not see the same. Okay? And so that being, you know, I don't know about you, but if you go back enough, like to my age or whatever, you know, there are things like, well, that's what, you know, men do that, or women do this. Like, it was like clear in everybody's head, this is what women do. That's a woman's job. That's a man's job. That's a woman's task. That's a man's task. Oh, that's a lot of nonsense. Okay? Traditionally, maybe certain things in the past women had done more than men or men had done more than women. It doesn't mean that it's an exclusive thing and something horrible is going to go wrong if somebody else does it. Okay? But it's the way we're sort of predisposed because of our experiences growing up and the inputs that we've had culturally and you know, through media and everything else and our experiences. And so when we talk about the expectations list, it's simply you writing down, I mean, that's what I was telling John to do as a single, simply writing down, this is what I'm expecting a wife to be like and to do and, and, and how our relationship should look. And this is what I'm going to be bringing to the table and offering her, okay? And so when I've been doing the roles of men and women, the simplicity would be like the man has to at least understand his role is to provide and protect, okay? And ladies, your role at the very minimum is there to be a helper or support to his providing and protecting. Oh, there's a whole lot more detail than that. Because you may have an expectation that... When I get home from work, I expect dinner on the table, okay? Or you may have an expectation that, hey, whenever I get around to it, I'll just grab something to eat. Well, guess what? If you don't have the same feeling, somebody's going to be frustrated. Well, I worked all day and I have this meal ready for you and you don't even care because you guys never had the conversation. You know, Billy talked a little bit about intimacy. Well, guess what? You may have very different expectations about intimacy, what it looks like when you're being intimate, how often, all these other things, you know? I mean, you may have very different ideas about that. You may have different ideas about things like, do you take your shoes off when you walk in the house? You know, do, how do you deal with, you know, things, you know, with furniture or this or that or toothpaste caps or seat, you know, toilet seats up or down. I mean, these are all things that lead to divorce. You understand that, okay? You know, who's putting the garbage out? Who's doing the shopping? How are the bills being paid? Okay, by how I mean like physically, actually, who's actually doing the bill paying? Who's handling these tasks, you know? My wife and I had a little adjusting to do in the beginning because there was a bunch of things that her brothers and father always did that I never did, because my father never did them. And so she had an expectation I would do a bunch of things. And of course, I ended up going out, like for example, I didn't change my own oil, I went and had my oil changed. Because that's something we go on with the car, she expected me to handle it a certain way, which I still handled it, just not the way she thought, because this is the way she's used to. So now she's got a slight disappointment. This is early on in our marriage because I'm not meeting an expectation that I was not aware of, which is why the questions that Elder gave you are very important, because then you can have a conversation and ask, what do you, is there anything that I'm not doing that you need? Is there anything, that, you know, am I not loving you the way that, that you need to be loved? I mean, what does that look like to you? Okay. You know, maybe you're thinking, I'm the man, and I'm going to come home, and after I eat, I'm going to turn on the TV, and I'm going to watch the news for four hours. And your wife may be thinking, no way. <laughs> or vice versa. Well, then you have to have a conversation about the entertainment expectations the, that you have socially with the two of you doing things, because, you know... We do lots of things together living in the same house. And that's really the problem when you're dating is that you really don't know. Unless you've been married before, then you have a little idea. But if you've never been married, you don't know what you're getting into. You, and you can't. I know you've seen your parents and you think you know. But you really don't know what it's like to live with somebody. You know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I know you're not together all day. But still, no matter where you turn around, they're there. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just getting in each other's way in the kitchen can be annoying. Because there you are in the kitchen, you're doing something, and the other one walks in, and all of a sudden they want to do something, now they're in your way. Or you're in their way. Okay, there's just simple things that we, you, know, you have to deal with. So in all relationships, 
all I'm asking you to do with this list is to kind of bring to awareness what's already there, but you're just not really thinking about it. Because you already have an expectations list in your head, so to speak, okay? That's why you get disappointed. Have you ever been disappointed in life? It's because an expectation wasn't met. You go to a restaurant, you have an expectation about the server. You have an expectation about the food, right? You go to a store, you have an expectation about certain things with the store. Okay, any business you do, you have an expectation. They also have an expectation of you walking in as a customer. And so those things aren't generally talked about very much. They're just assumed. And guess what? When people assume, they get in trouble. Because we're almost always wrong when we make those assumptions. All right? Okay, Taylor. Thank you for the teaching. It was amazing. You're welcome. Um, so my question is, when you were talking with Ashley, <laughs> you said that there were certain things that you didn't say to your wife or communicate with her. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sort of asking for a reminder about what Rabbi said. Um, how do we distinguish between... I know that, like, in my, in my brain, I know, like, okay, you don't say certain things to your husband because that's for you or for your friends or something, but... I'm, I'm having a hard time distinguishing, like, how do I tell, okay, this is for my husband, or this is for, like, a friend, or something to keep to myself and pray about? Yeah. So what I practice, and this part of my disclaimer, what I practice is I know her because I'm communicating over communicating. I know my wife. I know there's some things I cannot share with her. Not that I wouldn't share with her. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put that emotional burden on her. Me and Rabbi have an incredible job, and Rabbi Tom, that we listen to a lot of counseling. So I could, if I did not have my emotions in check, go home with a whole lot of nonsense that I deal with in counseling. But I'm not going to pour that on her plate if I have something that I couldn't detach before I got home. Maybe it was emotional or something that was traumatic or whatever, helping somebody to get through a process. I may not put that on her plate because I know she can't handle it. I know there's some decisions that we make or some discussions that me and Rabbi have that only he and I can have, or he and I in, in leadership, there's some things in our leadership meeting only the leaders can talk about. So it's those kinds of things that I know will take an emotional burden or be an emotional burden or weight for her that's not hers to handle. So I got to be careful, and I've learned from the sake, putting things on her plate that is not hers to, to bear the weight emotionally. So when I realized I did that, I stopped doing that, so I'm not giving her that weight. Now, All right, let, let me just clarify the last part, what he said there, just because like, he really kind of packages what you were asking, which is when you're newly married, you're going to mess this up occasionally, but you got to be observing, learning, and adjusting. So as you get to know each other really well, you start to realize this is something I don't need to share. Not because I'm hiding it, just because it doesn't need to create that kind of a, an emotional stirring in a negative way or disturbance because it doesn't serve any productive purpose. She doesn't need or he, you know, the husband doesn't need whatever. It doesn't need to have all that drama. And drama can come, I guess, in either direction when it comes to that, unintentionally causing the drama, okay? So again, we don't want you to hide anything from your spouses, that is not what he's saying. But over time, you will learn, and by the way, your answer to your question is by making mistakes. Mm -hmm. In other words, not a mistake, because you, you should have known better, but you realize, oh, that's probably something I don't need to do again. Because it didn't go well, he didn't need to know, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And he may even say to you, hey, that's stuff I don't need to know. By the way, that kind of communication happens when you are close enough, where one spouse could tell the other spouse, you know what, in the future, why don't you just keep that to yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't need that. <laughs> hey, hold on but, to that one. But really, the, I, I can tell the question you're having was, can you know in advance? And the answer is, not at the beginning. You have to kind of play it out, and then you'll learn. Now, you might guess, but I would love for all of you to try to be as communicating as possible, communicative, communicative as possible, at least initially, and then learn what stuff probably doesn't need to be shared. I have literally told my wife, hey, I don't need to know that stuff. Whatever it is, I say, listen, I don't need to know that stuff. Okay? Because she'll go to share, and I say, that's fine. You can share if you want. I just, need you to, I just need to tell you, I don't need to know that stuff. But if you want to share it, that's fine. Okay? Now, remember, also, it has to do with the... How do I want to word this? I don't want anybody to get offended. How fragile you are emotionally. The stronger the emotional person that you're dealing with is, the more you can share anything. Okay? 
So it's not an insult. I'm just saying is all of us deal with certain levels of emotional fragility, okay? And the more fragile they are in a specific area, let's say, very strong in some and weaker in others. All, all, all of us have that kind of balance where we're very strong emotionally sometimes and in other areas we're not, okay? Okay, I have a reputation in my family that when everything is going to you know what in a handbag, I'm the guy you want to have around because somehow I'm mostly, I'm more calm in that than in any other thing. Mm -hmm. That's when I'm calm and I've got everything focused. Okay, so I'm the guy to go to when it's all falling apart. Other people, that's the last person you want to go to when all of it's falling apart because they're falling apart. So you got to learn those things, right? And so, you know, so one may be very good, hey, you can tell me anything because they're strong enough to handle all that. The other one may be like, you know what, I, I probably don't need to hear that, okay? And so you just have to be able to communicate that. All right, Tamara. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, thank you, Elder Burley. Um, I appreciate your message, that was awesome. Okay. Um, my question is for you or Rabbi, <laughs> <laughs> whichever one decides to answer. So we've heard some um, information and um, kind of guidance on traditional um, uh, family dynamics, such as the man working and the woman staying at home. But my role is reversed, um, it, per se. I mean, Rob works half part-time or whenever, but I have a full-time job. In fact, I'm working, still working two jobs, and now work six days a week. So what is your advice for people who are trying to um, step into this new expectation? Because, you know, you have your expectations when you get married, but when something like this comes up and it changes the whole scheme of things, I mean, um, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of adjustments and a lot of uh, bad adjustments that are going on. So I know he's gonna add to what I'm gonna say, but <laughs> which is good. So I always approach those challenges with communication. You need to communicate about it. It's better if you can communicate before the storm. I have a saying that I say around here at work is I like to be ahead of the storm. I don't wanna be in it, I don't wanna be behind it, I wanna be ahead of it. So I'm always thinking ahead, I'm always looking ahead, I'm always looking from a, a, his 50,000 feet, I guess I'm 40,000, but anyway, <laughs> we're looking from an oversight. I'm looking for everything that could possibly go wrong, every situation, I already figured out how I'm gonna end it if it deals with it. If there's a situation in the room, I already figured out how I'm getting out, what path I'm taking, who I need to get to, all those things are in my brain already. So if you know that you're gonna encounter something with work or an expectation, because now you're saying your expectation is changing, I would have talked to my husband or wife beforehand and said, hey baby, we need to talk about this because this thing is gonna change some dynamics in our relationship and I don't wanna have to get in an argument with you later or have a disagreement about it if we can deal with it now. So you know that this job is coming, you know that there's gonna be six days a week. I'm not too concerned, you know, to make, keep it broad, uh, he's, he's, work, he's retired, he's working part time. Now you're in the work field and you're working a bunch of hours. You guys really need to sit down and communicate because the expectation is changing as to what used to be versus what's going on. And one thing women don't like me to say, but you gotta deal with it, and I say it a lot, if you love your husband, you need to submit in that way. Now, how can two walk together unless they agree? So I'm not saying submit, you gotta listen to whatever he says. You guys gotta submit means you have to come in agreement because now expectations are changing and both you need to come together to agree how you're gonna walk forward together. Does that make sense? So it, it takes communication and you guys going back to the drawing board because some expectations are changing which is causing the strife because things aren't, are changing and you guys have to come to an agreement. And understand it could be a heated debate all right, so look, I, I love everything he said. I'm gonna just kind of reiterate some of it a little bit, right? Life is not static, okay? Somebody gets sick, somebody dies, somebody gets injured, somebody loses their job. So life is not static. The dynamic does change on a regular basis. So what you may have started with is not what you end up with down the road in terms of some of these big areas of life, okay? So he was doing the, the primary providing work-wise and you were not, and now that has switched. That's a big change, all right? 
And so, as he said, then there needs to be a discussion about how does that now affect these various things that we do. I think that the really important thing to understand is, number one, there's no right way to do this. The only right way to do this is the way you agree to. Oh, Okay, so if you can agree that you're providing and doing this work because that's what you, your dream was to be a nurse and do these things and that he's done his job and now he's able to retire, as long as you guys can agree on how that looks, it doesn't matter that you're making more money than he is now or whatever that may be, okay? I know other couples where you know the skill set of the woman and the skill set of the guy worked out that she actually can make more money than he can, so they made a decision for him to be at home instead of her, but as long as it works for you and your spouse. However, don't let the vertical get screwed up. Just because you make more money or primarily make, maybe you make all the money, that doesn't make you in charge, and that's the hard part. Because then if the man wants to say no to how you spend that money, or tell you what to do with that, you're like, but it's my money. Not the way you guys agreed when you got married. It's your money together, and he has authority to make sure that it gets handled a certain way. It doesn't matter which one of you is making it. There's still a headship there. And that's hard, though. And I've told everybody that's ever been in a situation where the one person, you know, the spouse, the woman, meaning specifically, is making more money than the man, that be careful that you don't get your vertical all screwed up. Okay, which is why I tell people, you know, like Mercy, who makes a good living, I said, look, you need to find, yeah, I'm picking on you a little bit. Okay, that you need to find a man that doesn't need your money, even if you still make more than him, because mm -hmm. then he still can be the provider. Okay, but if you're in a dynamic, especially as you get older, maybe the woman's still working or decides to start a new career as you did, and he hits his retirement. Well, that should be workable as long as you both agree. Now, of course, it could turn into bitterness where you're now working six days a week or whatever, and you go home and you see him just sitting around. Just realize that almost every guy has that experience with his wife at some point. <laughs> you know, we work all day, come home, and the wife looks like, looks like she's just sitting around. I know she's not, but it may look that way, all right? Look, my wife was ready to throw a fit when she first stopped working as a dental hygienist, which meant that she was home when I was home. Now, she didn't understand at first what I did because she would get up before me, go to work, and then come home, and I would be working by the time she came home. Now she was still waking up at 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning, and I was asleep until 11. Now, but she didn't understand that I went to bed at 4, okay? And the work that I did until she got to stay up a little bit in real, because she was like sitting there fuming for four hours. <laughs> that lazy son of a, okay? <laughs> Could you imagine? I mean, she got up at seven. She got up like she always did. Now she didn't know that I didn't wake up like an hour after she left. She just figured I got up right away by the time she left to go to work. Oh no. But she also didn't know that I had just gone to sleep five hours earlier. <laughs> by the time she woke up, maybe two hours earlier. She had no idea. So it took an adjustment because she had no idea to, uh, how to appreciate what was going on. So now, now we have the dynamic that a lot of, this again goes back to what you said, Tamara, which is the adjusting. People have to adjust when people retire. They're used to both people or at least one of them going to work and now both are home all the time driving each other crazy. Like, who are you and when are you leaving? <laughs> like, go get a job, get out of my face, get out of my house. Find something to do. But it's an adjustment, all right? And so, which was also harder because I was doing the ministry out of the house when all this happened. So I was home all the time. I come here now. I don't stay home most of the time now. So I'm at the office. I'm here at the building, you know. And then she actually stays home and does all of the YM2I programming and stuff from the house most of the time, but then comes here. But you got to understand that adjustment was a little tough at first. Because she was all excited that she got to retire from doing dental hygiene. But she didn't realize is that she hadn't understood what I'd been doing because we didn't interact on that level. She went to bed before I did, so she didn't have any idea what I was doing after she went to bed because she went to bed at like 11. And she got up at like 7 or 6 or whatever it was in the morning and left before I woke up. And then the reality kicked in. She got up and I'm still sleeping and sleeping to like noon almost, because I may have gone to bed at f five or something, because I used to do that every day. And so you can imagine the challenge and the adjusting to that that would be there. Tamara, did that help? 
okay? So it's just a matter of having a conversation saying, hey, Rob, we need to talk about how this does or doesn't change anything and deal with how I feel about it and just readjust the way you look at everything because that dynamic has changed in quite a big way, all right? In a positive way, I'm sure, in a lot of ways. All right. Well, it is 5.30. I know we didn't take a whole lot from the live stream. Was there any important ones last that we didn't get to? Now we're good? <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that was a blessing. Elder did a great job. Thank you. Thank you.